I was warned by previous uh, commencement speakers that um, you will absolutely be overshadowed by the student speaker <laughs> and not to be intimidated by that. Um, and that might be the case uh, but uh, in the past, but I feel like this year it was particularly uh, a ringing. Um. So it's wonderful to be here. It's extraordinarily humbling uh, to be standing here before you all. Um, the work that you've done, the degrees you've earned, and earned the hard way, have prepared you for the greatest job in the world, journalist. You should be incredibly proud, and you do credit to this great institution, which has flooded the ranks of newsrooms with some of the most ambitious and diverse journalists in the country. Congratu congratulations to all of you on this great achievement, and to your families, who today are filled with justifiable pride. It was just 17 years ago that I was in a cap and gown somewhere uptown, just like you all, master's degree in hand, and wondering what the world of journalism might hold for me. But really, my journey to becoming a journalist began long, long before then, as I'm sure it did for many of you. I witnessed my first big breaking news event when I was six. It was a coup. Well, it was an attempted coup. I was living in Kenya with my family. My dad and my brothers were out of town. So it was just me and my mom at home that, in our apartment that day. It was the early 1980s, probably before many of you were born. And at first, to my six-year-old imagination, the coup seemed really exciting. The apartment complex where we lived was locked down and buzzed with nervous energy. Soon, there were domestic workers who lived in a block of flats behind the complex who started streaming out into the streets, returning with armloads of goods, clothes, electronics, canned food. I got very excited and said to my mother, who was pretty scared, Mom, the shops are all open and everything's free. Can we go? <laughs> Obviously, the answer was no. She closed the curtains, peeking out every few minutes to make sure the tanks weren't rolling in. Not long after, I saw a man coming into our apartment complex who was balancing a small refrigerator on his head. A large flap of skin had been torn from his face and blood streamed onto his clothes. It was only then that I realized the gravity of what was happening. I was terrified, but I was also enthralled to have a front row seat to history as it unfolded before my eyes. That early act of witness formed a huge part of my desire to be a journalist, to watch events unfold, to try and understand them and make them understandable to others. My second coup, yes, there were two, came in my high school years in Ghana, where I had a front row seat to the transition from military rule to democracy. Jerry Rawlings, the military dictator who had ruled Ghana since the 1970s, shucked off his army uniform and ran for office in a genuinely free and fair election. These were momentous historic events. They shaped how I viewed the world, the nature of citizenship, my sense of what's possible and how individuals can change the world. As a kid, and I, and I know you'll all relate to this, I was constantly asking, why? Why did people have to pay bribes to get an apartment in a government-owned building? Why couldn't our Kenyan and Ghanaian neighbors come to the United States as easily as we could visit their countries? I always wanted to know what's really going on and I wanted to explore and investigate the world around me. Journalism was, journalism was the obvious and perhaps only way to satisfy this passion. My stories might seem like exotic ones from faraway places, but I bet many of you became journalists for very similar reasons. Maybe you saw something in your community that didn't seem right, that didn't seem fair. A politician who needed exposing. A company that exploited its workers. A police force beyond accountability a neighborhood racked by crime but ignored by local, local officials, a school district populated by black and brown folks starved of resources, while a predominantly white school across the literal or metaphorical tracks swam in cash and sent its graduates to Ivy League schools. As a kid abroad and later as a foreign correspondent, I saw too many societies that didn't have the benefits of a robust and free press, that didn't have that rigorous scrutiny. Power was always concentrated in too few hands. People didn't trust institutions, private or public. Facts were ordered and prioritized by the powerful. And there was fundamentally no truth, except for what the leader said was true. Sound familiar? I could always feel how fragile those places were. Things here in America, they feel fragile now too. 
When anything can be derided as fake news, where do we find that great common ground that makes citizenship and democracy possible? You're all entering our shared profession at a precarious but exciting moment. During the 2016 election cycle, I was pretty depressed about the power of journalism to change the world. We all were. Story after story exposing the fundamental unfitness of the Republican nominee seemed to make no difference at all. Exposés of his shady business practices rolled right off him. A recording of him talking about sexually assaulting women, along with a collection of highly credible allegations, almost all of them on the record, from women who'd been on the receiving end of his unwanted sexual attention. They all seemed to have no impact at all. And when Trump won, there was a lot of hand-wringing. Did cable news treat Trump's candidacy like entertainment rather than interrogating him as a serious candidate? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. <laughs> Did the roiling, angry, white, middle, and working classes get enough coverage? Was elite media too wrapped up in its coastal bubbles? Did we miss the big story? At the time, I was working at the New York Times, and I can tell you, we did plenty of those stories about the discord in the heartland. Many, many, many of them. So did other organizations. But it seemed like we were in this moment of perhaps self paralyzing self-reflection. But then something happened. Journalism got its mojo back. In the past year, we have seen some of the finest accountability journalism I've seen in my career. Two incredibly resourceful beat reporters at Politico caught the health secretary red-handed taking very expensive private jets on the government dime. Their expose ended his tenure. We've had breathtaking reporting on the investigation into the election meddling by Russia and possible collusion with the Trump administration from a wide range of newsrooms. The earth-shaking work of the New York Times and the New Yorker exposing the sexual predations of Harvey Weinstein and breaking the dam of silence and shame about the pervasiveness of sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace. Digital newsrooms like BuzzFeed, The Daily Beast, and the one that I lead, HuffPost, broke major stories too. The whole news system ecosystem is firing on all cylinders, and it's marvelous to see. At the same time, though, we're living in a moment when basic questions about our identity as a nation are being asked in sometimes really scary ways. Many of us were raised to believe that we're a nation of immigrants, people like my mother, who was born in Ethiopia. That's the Statue of Liberty Nation, all of us weaving together something novel, fibrous, lasting, from our disparate experiences and perspectives. But things feel very different now. Just last week, a Republican Congressman, Steve King, tweeted that, quote, diversity is not our strength, a chilling echo of a white nationalist rallying cry by a supposedly mainstream political figure. We're witnessing a newly permissive attitude towards hate speech and hate crimes that have led to increased attacks on Jews, Muslims, and all kinds of marginalized people. People who came to America as young children who have committed no crimes face being exiled to nations they have never known. As a daughter of an African immigrant, as a woman, as a person of color, as a queer person, as an American, I'm watching these conversations unfold with particular alarm. I know a lot of you in this room who look like me, who grew up like me, who live lives like mine, are feeling the same way. So what do we as journalists do? Our first duty, of course, is to hold institutions of power to account. That includes President Trump and his government, as well as the Republican-controlled House and Senate. But it very much includes the Democratic Party and Democratic officials around the country, as well as the infrastructure of government and the institutions of corporate power. As journalists, we have to make sure that they feel the full brunt of our relentless investigative reporting and our analytical and intellectual probing. But we have another duty that's perhaps just as important. We must listen. This fall, HuffPost went on a bus tour, visiting 26 cities across the nation. Our goal was to listen to America in this extraordinary moment. We avoided the coasts and the major urban centers, and we stopped in smaller cities like Birmingham, Alabama, Livingston, Montana, and Fort Wayne, Indiana. We had hoped to interview about 500 people over seven weeks. We, we weren't sure anybody was gonna show up when our bus rolled into town. We need not have worried. It turns out Americans have a lot to say, and they really want to be heard. We spoke to nearly 2,000 people, and what they told us was remarkable. Almost no one talked about Trump, and it wasn't in the Voldemort, dare not utter his name kind of way. <laughs> it was that people had much more pressing local issues on their mind. 
At the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, where four little black girls were killed in a Klan bombing in 1963, we held a forum on local crime. That night, a largely black audience told their entirely black city leadership that something needed to be done about the plague of violent crime in the city. It was an important reminder that in the age of Black Lives Matter, when we seek to hold police departments to account for overzealous enforcement policies and outright violence on communities of color, many such communities also suffer from the serious problem of law enforcement neglect. The complexity and nuance of our communities gets lost in shouty headlines and cable news chatter. In Iowa, we heard from people intensely proud of how their communities had welcomed refugees and Im immigrants. In New Orleans, we worked with a local news organization to expose how Airbnb is altering the fabric of the city's historic neighborhoods, hollowing them out of local residents and replacing them with tourists. Mostly, we heard stories about communities that are facing struggles, but are also coming together, talking, debating, arguing, finding imperfect solutions and we met courageous journalists who were managing, despite the tough odds of our business these days, to tell their stories. I'm not really big on advice. I think experience is much more important. But if I may presume to offer you one more piece of advice today, I would say this. Join them. It may seem that local news is dying, but it's not. It's being reborn in a thousand ways. Digital startups, creative nonprofits, crowdsourcing funded and subscriber supported. Skip that low level producer job in New York or the social media producer job in DC or LA. The renewal and the restoration of our profession and our country probably won't happen there. Take yourself, your whole self, deep into this country and tell its story. It's vital to our democracy, to our future, and frankly, to our survival. I can't wait to see what you all do. Congratulations.